A question for Martin. Um, it was, uh, so basically you believed that the excess mortality was due to sudden cardiac death, and I believe about 50% of your patients were, had ICDs. Have you interrogated them to find out whether you might be able to predict who uh, was at risk? As you might think, we are, indeed. <laughs> uh, it's an advantage having about more than 50% of these patients had implantable devices with defibrillator function. So we have a lot of data in there. The shock pattern is not straightforward, though, I have to say. We haven't finished our analysis, but there were actually um, more shocks in the control group rather than oh. the ESV group. Now, whether it's tachyarrhythmia or whether actually we have more bradyarrhythmias like asystole or PEA in the group we have to look at. So lots mm -hmm. and lots of questions, but we do have some data. We're also going through all of the deaths now and classifying them about whether they were truly sudden or not and the mm -hmm. circumstances of them. As you can appreciate, huge amount of work. So we'll have data maybe by the end of the year, early next year. Very yeah. important point. Yeah. So I guess the other question that, that uh, begs uh, answering is, um, an on-treatment analysis, Now I realize that that could take time, but uh, can you tell us anything about that? Or I mean, the reason I ask is because there were quite a few dropouts, 29% in the uh, ASV group and 60% crossovers in the control group, quite high. On, so I think treatment, an, uh, on so treatment I think analysis is on its way. It's on its way. But okay. it takes, as always, it takes time. Of course. Once again, I guess next year you will see the data. Yeah. Okay, great. So one more comment. Um, while I agree, obviously, that in clinical practice we shouldn't be using this device to treat uh, central apnea patients with heart failure, however, we are continuing our trial with both central apnea and obstructive apnea. So I think the one proviso I would make is that if you're going to do this, you're going to use this in central apnea, it should be in the context of a randomized trial. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think just to re-emphasize that point, all of us are saying we don't need less research, we need more research in this mm -hmm. area, absolutely. Hi, uh, McNicholas Dublin. Uh, just to extend the uh, comment on arrhythmias, um, your mortality data suggested the possibility of arrhythmia contributing to, to mortality in the ASV population. Did you look at baseline arrhythmias and particularly the prevalence of atrial fibrillation in your population? Because we've demonstrated over 20 years ago in separate publications in ERJ and Thorax that the presence of atrial fibrillation has a substantial impact on the cardiac response to intrathoracic positive air pressure in that patients with atrial fibrillation have a negative cardiac output response, whereas those in sinus rhythm have a positive cardiac output response relating to a shift in the balance between the left heart and the right heart. Do you have data on the prevalence of atrial fibrillation in your population and whether that might have been uh, a contributing factor to mortality in these patients? Two things to say to that. We do have data on the baseline history of atrial fibrillation and also whether there are atrial fibrillation at baseline. Uh, there was no imbalance between the two groups at that point in time. But it's a good point that we might look for effect modification of the hazard by that history of atrial fibrillation and presence of AF. Unfortunately, we don't have, going through the five, six years follow-up, a record of who then has gone into atrial fibrillation. So we can't do a kind of um, uh, time-varying covariate analysis. But good points. We will be looking at that. Thank you. Now, we need some questions for the other panel members. So some nice questions about respiratory physiology. Much appreciated. <laughs> Sir. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that we have to, to learn about uh, camp up results. Um, yeah, and in fact, I, I saw that the results in terms of uh, um, residual apnea, hypopnea index is, is low in your study. But uh, do you plan to make a um, postdoc analysis concerning the response to the AESV in terms of apnea, hypopnea index uh, to evaluate us in CAMPAP trial the mortality related to apnea, hypopnea correction? Well, I can answer to that. I think, unfortunately, uh, there, there is no effect. I mean, you want actually to look whether those who were not corrected for central events, this is not the case, actually. We, we, we will go further on that, but it is very clear that it is not related to the fact that there is no uh, efficiency in some patients, and it is not the reason for the increased mortality. Um, interesting presentations. Could you speculate why the six-minute walk dropped in those who had ASV? Well, it only drops at the very end, as you noticed. I thought it was the last two The last points. two points, data yeah. points, yes. But toward the end of the follow-up period, it did seem to be, if anything, 
that the exercise tolerance was less in the ESV group. I think, and I'll get the respiratory side of that in a minute, I don't think we should over-interpret it. We took a lot of measures of functional capacity, we took lots of time points, and the p-value is below 0 0.05, but not hugely. So actually, I'm not playing that up. I think the wealth of the way we triangulated that is it doesn't make any difference on the functional capacity of your patient, whether you used ASV or not. Not a survival advantage or a survival disadvantage at no. that time? No. No. It's just really a technical um, methodological question about your mixing of polygraphy and PSG. Um, if you just, with the polygraphy, you don't have EEG. So how did you measure the arousal index in okay. those patients? Did well, you the, use the, pulse yeah. transit time? Or? No, no, no. There was no arousal index in, in, in oh, those okay. with polygraphy. Oh, okay. So the analyses that you showed and, and were just all the results PSG. that we've shown are actually reported to recording time, including the PH for PhD, which actually homogenized the results. But of course, you're right. And that means also that we, of course, haven't scored some hypopneas due to the fact that we didn't have the arousal for PG. Well, and also, obviously, if you're just using the PG, you will have periods of wakefulness, so they That's will right, have yes. a higher number. And I'm, I'm really quite surprised. We did a study a number of years ago looking at, I mean, obviously, technology's moved on, using limited uh, systems uh, to, to score for central events, and we found it was incredibly un, unreliable, not very productive. So what, did you look at the sort of devices that you used? Well, I think we, we probably would provide further detailed analysis. Our impression is actually that you have, a, on one hand, you have a, a, an underestimation of the severity, an overestimation of the severity, uh, no, an underestimation, underestimation of the severity yes. because you yeah. actually yeah. increase the uh, denominator. On the other end, we miss some hypopnea. So we have to check whether it's actually, I think it's neutral, but we will check that. Yep. I, I suppose you have a today's a difference of uh, adherence in the, of mo with the mortality in the treatment group. Is there, is there a difference? Not as no. yet. We're doing an on-treatment analysis, but it's not yet available. Um, but don't get your hopes up. Um, <laughs> it's not going to go in the right and get rid of the effect. I can tell you that from a rough and ready look at it. Number two. Yeah, uh, I, I would like to ask uh, how the titration was made in those especially who were... Um, investigated with portable devices, the titration of the ASV. All, all uh, titrations were done in a hospital, uh, and they were supervised, of course, and uh, the aim was always to overcome obstruction of the upper airways, of course, by changing the uh, EPAP and by changing the swing to overcome central sleep apnea. And another important issue was to control uh, for leak, which also plays a significant role. Do you have any data uh, on deaths? How many of those were uh, on portable devices versus? Uh, Do we know? Uh, perhaps Dr. Worla in the front row. Do you know? Steve, chief study person. No, we did a subgroup analysis based on countries because it was based on countries. And the country didn't have an influence, which suggests that the type of monitoring doesn't have an influence. And we checked that the sub-study patient had a different outcome than the main study, because sub-study had your PSG, that's where we did wrong in this stuff, that also didn't have an effect. So we checked it, um, yet in subgroup analysis, didn't find a modifying effect on the primary outcome or on the mortality. It's important to say the CERV HF, the main study has been published in the New England Journal, but Patrick Levy presented the sub study, which hasn't been published yet, which was about 300 or so patients who had PSG serially and had echo. MRI, neuropeptides, all sorts of things. So well, don't mix uh, up the two data sets. Okay. So, some people uh, just put an IPAP of zero just not to increase the uh, ventilation when you have the hyperventilation event. Now I saw that you, you start with a three. Is that three centimeters? Two. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just uh, asking if you some patients were uh, overcorrected and that might have increased the sympathetic activity um, or maybe some of those had instability of the airways if the EPUB was not properly adjusted because you, you, you used the standard setting, you didn't have the... Uh well, I think we cannot answer to the question of hyperventilation, but we can answer on the, on the fact that uh, apparently the obstructive events were relatively well corrected. Uh, yeah, uh, Dempsey, Wisconsin, thank you for that uh Terrific presentation. 
The, the idea that Shane Stokes respiration might be adaptive bothers me a great deal. The, one of the main things that I think Dr. Naughton and was emphasized up here is the effect of large inspirations on sympathetic activity. And it was our data that he cited for that. And we studied that extensively. And that's only a, mo a, a momentary thing that happens during inspiration. In the steady state, sympathetic activity is not affected at all in the human by changing breathing pattern. But what is there that affects sympathetic activity is the intermittent hypoxemia. Your patients spent over 55% of their sleep time below 90% saturation. Minutes. Plus it's oscillation, mm. cyclical oscillations. I've got to I think that would be the dominant effect on increasing sympathetic activity. Can somebody comment on that? Yeah, I, I can try to answer to Jerry Dempsey. I, I think we have a sub-study that we, we, we will publish with this patient looking at MSNA before and after uh, ASV. And, and actually, I must say that apparently uh, the uh, sympathetic activity is not decreasing during ASV. So the reason for that, I don't know, but... Uh yeah, well, I think none of us was happy with the result, that <laughs> is for sure. And we've all tried to do <laughs> mental gymnastics and trying to re-examine it. But I think the editorial that accompanied the paper and in our paper, we said presumably either it's the positive airway pressure applied to poor ventricles in some way, but there's no progressive heart failure increase in deaths or hospitalizations or acute hemodynamic deterioration, or there's something about getting rid of chain stokes in this population by this means that is associated with an increase in arrhythmia. Now, that may not be a mechanical thing. It may be, and of course, arrhythmia in heart failure patients is very multifactorial. So I think we don't quite have enough pieces in the jigsaw to put them all together. Hopefully, in the next three or four months, we'll have a lot more data to share with you. On the positive pressure side, if I may ask, is there any, was there any thought, or is this commonly done, to pretest for that, to look at the effects of positive pressure in your patient selection yeah, acute, that, acutely? Yeah. Afterwards, I mean, <laughs> of course, we, we, we would, have, would have loved to have a, a test of ASV, even acutely, in these patients. Because that might be that, in some patients at least, even acutely, that could lead to redu reduction in cardiac output. But we don't have that. That yeah. would be, of course, extremely interesting. It would be lovely to reverse engineer the trial and do it the way we wanted to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Number three. Yeah. I'm Dr. Bashur from Helsinki. We all learned that one study, only one study, w should not make our practice changed radically. And now we almost all are changing our practice radically. So do you think that in the near future there would be a similar study and would the ethical committee would give their permission? Well, what an interesting loaded question that is. You well know there is a trial that's going on that recruits similar patients, so we will have some more data, but just to push back slightly, just one trial. You guys were going to use this therapy without any trial, without any randomized outcome data. You've now got five times more data than CAMPAP, and you're criticizing us for not doing another trial. I mean, you can't have it both ways, mate. Sorry. <laughs> I'm joking. Obviously, I'm not as cross as I sound, really. Number two. Uh, Michael Laup, Copenhagen. Um, you could say that ASV is a kind of uh, non-invasive ventilation. You could call it variable uh, NIV or intermittent NIV. Have you discussed if uh, NIV uh, shouldn't be allowed it in, in these patients with heart failure? Well, can, can My, I just try to answer to that. I, I think the problem we have here uh, since we cannot exclude an hemodynamic effect related to the expiratory pressure, at least theoretically, uh, NIV, like BiPAP or whatever, should be worse. I mean, yeah. if, if there is an hypothesis, and this is not excluded, that there is a reduction in venous return, I mean, the, the expiratory pressure should be higher than what is used during ASV. So potentially, there is a worse effect that is expected. But it has, it has no consequences so far uh, about uh, NIV for these patients? 
I personally it, it, believe... It's, well, theoretical. Right. it's a radical. It contraindicates. Uh, it's, uh, I, I personally well. believe, based on this data, it's at the moment it is a critical thing to do that, to use it. We should be cautious. Mm. Uh, and once again, we need studies, but at the moment, my belief is by level ventilation is contraindicated. Mm. I don't know whether this is supported by you, the audience, but it is my strong mm. belief. And in the majority of patients, when you put them on bilevel ventilation, you also over-ventilate these patients, and that is also not a good thing. And I'm sorry, we're five minutes over, so I've been told that we have to wrap it up, but I'm sure the panel will still be here for you. Are we all right? And we have plenty of time. Oh, no. Have we, have? we have. It's all right. We have got time. Great. <laughs> so we'll do number three and then number two. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Richard, Richard starts from Lisbon. Um, I'm getting a little bit to the same question, that is, do you have any data regarding the development of the CO2 and the cardiovascular events? That is, do you have data if the CO2 decreased more in the patients that had actually cardiovascular events? Yes, I don't know if we will have data on that. Holger, will we have data on that? Yeah, yeah we have a, we'll have a little data, but I wouldn't you know, be able to be very confident that I'll give the answer to that. Um, but it's a, it's a good question. I think one of the things this trial has done is thrown up lots of questions. <laughs> and sadly, we have data for some of those questions, but for many we don't. So that's why more research is definitely needed. Number two. Kazuo from Kyoto, Japan. So the using time, adherence time is a, a significant correlation with the ejection fraction, no relationship. So adherence and ejection fraction relationship. As far as I recall, there's no association between the patient's left ventricular ejection fraction and the likelihood of them to adhere to the therapy and the length of time that they use it on average. As far as I know, there's no association between the two. Mm -hmm. Right, num number three. Yeah, thank you. Going back to the discussion regarding Regarding the hemodynamic effect, do you think there is a space to use oxygen therapy during the night? Do you think it's interesting in, uh, as an alternative, or should we conduct some uh, clinical trials using oxygen? I think this is a, a very difficult question, and, and if you go back to the editorial in the New England Journal of Medicine, it applies similarly, I guess, to phrenic stimulation. I mean, if we can make the hypothesis that we just discussed, that it is deleterious to suppress uh, shane stock respiration as a potential adaptive mechanism for whatever reason, then, I mean, we don't know at all if there is a beneficial effect that we can expect from, from oxygen therapy. And, and the level of evidence is quite low, actually. So I guess that apart from clinical trial, I would not suggest to use oxygen therapy. But just to expand on that, and if you allow me as a cardiologist to say, I'm quite surprised that about the lack of large outcome studies in some of the areas of respiratory medicine. I mean, that sounds a little critical. It is. I think you do need actually to test these hypotheses, particularly in my group of patients, heart failure, where actually you can have a lovely PowerPoint slide with how the physiology works. Mm -hmm. You then do an intervention to change the physiology, mm -hmm. and the answer is not as you expected. Mm -hmm. So I'm afraid both the regulators and the clinical community, particularly cardiac, demand higher quality evidence before they will change practice, before they start doing technologies. The phrenic nerve stimulation is a good, mm. um, and I don't want to rain on somebody's parade, but here is an implantable technology. Cardiologists love implanting things. It does partially treat central sleep apnea. A lot of enthusiasm. That enthusiasm now has very tempered where the implanting community have said, that's fine, you can show you change the physiology in a certain way, but I want to know what effect that has on the patient's outcomes. And therefore, you're not going to get an endorsement of the technology until you prove it in terms of outcomes. So I think it's a game changer in terms of working out what evidence you need to change practice. Um, just some comments, sorry to bang on. Number two, then number three. Peter Gardes, Frankfurt, Germany. Uh, many patients with central sleep apnea and uh, due to cardiac failure uh, will still have uh, many obstructive events, uh, 20, 30 per hour. Uh, what should we do with such patients? Uh, as it was mentioned, um, even CPAP will increase uh, left ventricular afterload. And uh, should one treat such patients with CPAP or not? Uh, we need some 
uh, some some tactical uh, well, suggestions. We've got three respiratory oh. physicians here. Why don't we see what they're going to do with that? So OSA, predominantly OSA. In oh, case yeah. of predominance OSA, I would do a CPAP trial. Uh, no, not predominant. It is uh, and half if there and is, half. Yeah, okay. <laughs> if there is residual, I first would try. And if it's possible to abolish or vastly to improve, move on. I believe you, you would do it. Yeah. Uh, Marie Pia? Yeah. I would answer like Helmut, try first CPAP and then if it doesn't work then in very narrow, you know, uh, door try ASV. But if the obstructive uh, events are predominant or at least fifty percent of the abnormal events. And and I think there is something that should be taken into account is the patient symptoms. If the patient is sleepy, I, I feel much more comfortable because then you have more chance to at least improve the quality of life. No, non-sleepy patient will have a better it's prognosis. It's quite difficult yeah. on non-symptomatic non patients. Okay, then we're going to get Patrick's comment, but remember Advent is also looking obstructive yeah, and, and, duck, and duck is systolic heart yeah. failure. That is so exactly my, my comment. I think at least for some of the, uh, of the subgroup with obstructive sleep apnea, the advantage if might provide the results, actually. Mm -hmm. Can we ask so Doc? Can I just make a comment? Yeah, so we're studying patients with uh, both with obstructive and central apnea with heart failure, but the ones with uh, obstructive apnea have to have an upward score of less than 10, and they have to have no complaint of being sleepy, because otherwise they would have an indication to be treated. Turns out the most heart failure patients don't, are not sleepy, and I'm sure you've seen that. Uh, and so I guess my answer to this gentleman's question is, we need a randomized trial to find out whether it works or not, and that's what we're doing. The question is who is willing to pay for the trial <laughs> for the next one? Well, we already have the funding. Yeah. Good. I wonder if obstructive and central and the oversimplification of that mm. is going to persist after we have more data. What actually is the important thing to measure in the physiology, particularly in a heart failure patient? And perhaps you can actually see the effect of a therapy and that's the important thing to determine. I just wonder if we actually just because something you can measure something doesn't necessarily mean it's the important thing. Yeah. Doug, you've moved back to the microphone, so presumably <laughs> well, you want to comment well, on that. Well, yeah, because it's, I think I have a, we have a study, uh, two studies, showing that uh, in uh, patients with obstructive apnea and heart failure, they have a progressive decline in their cardiac output and stroke volume during the obstructive apnea, and it rises during the ventilation. With central apnea, it's exactly the opposite. The, ventil a, the cardiac output goes up during the apnea and goes down during the hyperventilation. So the, <clears throat> moreover, the obstructive apneics in another paper we just published in the Canadian Journal of Cardiology, they have a progressive decline in their cardiac output overnight, which we don't see in patients without, uh, in patients with heart failure but without sleep apnea. And if we treat their uh, obstructive apnea with CPAP, it completely prevents the falling cardiac output overnight. So physiologically, uh, there is uh, reason to believe that uh, the negative intrathoracic pressure created by obstructive apnea, which we don't see in central apnea, has an adverse effect on, on chemodynamics that can be reversed. And central apnea may be different. Indeed. And of course, I don't want to say this out loud, but here I am, I'm going to say it. We have got lots of drugs that increase cardiac output and heart failure, and it kills them. No, no, I... Well, <laughs> <laughs> You're absolutely right, but what I said is the obstructive sleep apnea causes a progressive decline in cardiac output overnight, which is prevented by CPAP, but the CPAP doesn't raise it above the baseline level. So. <laughs> I love how limber you are. <laughs> Patrick. J just to mention something that we already uh, said during the presentation, but maybe the key issue is actually the severity of heart failure. I mean, those with uh, ejection fraction below 30, although of course it's not a magic figure, might be those with essentially, essentially central apnea and those where ASV was deleterious, although it's univariate analysis and, and, and so on, but it's, it's to take into account anyway. And Raphael has a question for us. So what happened to the patients who had central apnea but non chain soak central apnea? Yeah. Well, actually, if they had less than 20% chain stokes, so ipso facto, a lot of non-chain stokes, they actually point estimates for benefit, not harm. But that's a post hoc analysis, and the p-value is there, but it's a post hoc analysis. But it might be also something that we will study in the uh, core lab analysis in, in those with PHG, and that might actually Further, further details analysis, and uh, that might be also important to 
separates that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if we believe that a chain stokes is beneficial to this patient, then shouldn't we make another machine that increases the, the <laughs> early <laughs> What well, a good idea. Yes. No, no. Well, I think maybe they should all move to the mountains of Chile and then it'll get more chain stokes yeah. and perhaps live longer. I don't know. I think, I think it's what's interesting is the cardiac community, in terms of they had the data presented to them at the ESC about two weeks ago, they were fascinated by this. This doesn't switch them off central or obstructive sleep apnea or sleep disorder breathing at all. They say, oh gosh, that's interesting physiology. I wonder what's going on there. We've been down this line before in heart failure patients. Now we have a much better understanding. When's the next trial coming out? <laughs> what's happening? What should I do with OSA? Gosh, I don't even screen for OSA in my fat, hypertensive, diabetic patients. Maybe I should do. What's the evidence that makes a difference? And they will turn to you to give them advice on that. So don't think that this is, makes the interest less. It makes it much more amongst the cardiac community. But you need to go back to your evidence base and see what is the evidence base? What are the outcomes there? What is the appropriate way to counsel the patients? And I think it's going to be a very interesting five years to, to follow. Any final questions or comments from that? Or maybe we can hand back to our chairs to, um, for them to close. I have a last question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm what, trying. <laughs> well, what would you do if a patient is doing very well on, on uh, ASV and he refuses to stop even though he fulfills the criteria? Mm -hmm. Well, you see, this is where there's a difference in respiratory versus cardiac um, thing. I had to phone up patients at the end of the trial and say, you know that lovely device that you like, that's saving your life? Well, we've now got the results of the, of the trial and we suggest that you're not going to get any benefit from it. They say, oh, that's a shame, but, you know, it's been nice to take part in the trial. Well, I'd just like to continue with it. I said, well, here's the thing. I said, actually, overall, it doesn't benefit, but there is a suggestion, actually, it might increase the risk of, of, of death and dying from a rhythm problem. We don't know, but there is suggestion of risk using it. Oh, I feel absolutely fine. I'm sure the device has made me feel better. <laughs> I said, well, we know the answer to that because in the trial, the other half didn't have the device and they feel just as good as you do. So actually, why don't we try and get you off that? I think some patients want to be offered something else. I think respiratory community uh, believe that there is something magic about this, so want to continue something. But my cardiac patients, not a single one of them had any problems stopping a therapy. With that, when you explain the evidence base has shifted, that's why we do the trial. So actually, we didn't find it so difficult, but um, that, that's reassuring. But I think cardiologists are used to discussing sudden death and cardiac risk with their patients. Most of the patients are aware of that. It's always a risk benefit. Many of these patients have devices in. They're perfectly aware that they are mortal and there's various ways of dying. So that was my experience of that. I don't know about Helmut, you had a lot of patients and a lot of effort yes. had to go in. A bit different experience, so I guess we took 70 off, and uh, during the last three or four months, at least 10 of those returned to the laboratory, complained about nocturia, complained about uh, pure sleep quality and quality of life, and negotiated to start treatment again. They had to sign, of course. And I asked them, how do you feel? And within one week, most of the symptoms disappeared. But it is a subgroup, and we don't know how to define that subgroup. May I comment? Yeah, yeah um, I would be less enthusiastic than Helmut, because uh, we are not blind to the device. So uh, when a patient feels better, it might be a placebo effect. Uh, no, taking no probably quite a shocking example, uh, I don't know whether you remember the Mediator uh, big thing. And some of the patients were very happy with Mediator. Would you let your patient on, on Mediator? Maybe we should stop for two weeks and then see how Yeah. So it's, it's very tricky. I do agree, but uh, it's, it's really tricky. Uh, I think, of course, it's going to be difficult for some patients. But uh, I think if we, if we don't... Uh, if we are not so clear with the patient with that sort of evidence, then uh, I mean we, we don't need to go further for any study. I mean it's it's a it's a big study with a, a, a strong signal safety signal. We have to take that into account. Whether there is a, a clinical benefit, I, I, of course it's true, but I mean in in that case I would say that to the patient that we really have to stop the machine. 
And the other Just thing to say is, of course, please make sure the heart failure therapy is optimized as well, yeah, yeah, which actually yeah. has proven mortality benefit with ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, yeah. aldosterone antagonists, CRT therapy, ICD therapy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, yeah. uh, one more word. Actually, one of uh, we, we recorded again our patient, and surprisingly, some of them turned to uh, uh, obstructive sleep apnea syndrome, in which case you feel much more comfortable to uh, set up new therapy. Uh, and uh, it's probably important also to get more data regarding this patient, uh, uh, this group in which we are going to, to suppress uh, SV therapy. And we, we try to implement a registry mm -hmm. of withdrawal in France. And I would uh, strongly suggest to extend this registry to at the international level because it's important to at least uh, these are going to be uh, observational data, but it's again interesting to look at what, what is uh, uh, the follow up of this patient uh, uh, without ASV. Any f final issues? Can I hand back to the chairs then? Oh, I can finish. How wonderful. Super. Thank you all very much for your attention. We'll publish as much data as we can. Enjoy your conference.